then that perhaps he wasn't much older than his father. The man listened patiently while Angus showed him how to work the camera. All he had to do was look through the viewfinder and press the button. But he did this before Angus, Angus was in position, and then it seemed he might have pressed something else by accident and Angus had to go back and check it and then return. And all the time, Isabel and Michael were holding their pose in the cold, Isabel with her legs folded beneath her, one hand clutching her mug and the other holding her hair off her face, and Michael on his hunkers a couple of feet away, feeling the pins and needles in the backs of his knees. And he heard Isabel say through clenched teeth, for God's sake, and somehow knew from the way she said it that it was over between his parents and that whatever this photograph was recording, it wasn't family happiness. And he wondered why on earth his father was going to all the trouble. For posterity, perhaps, is what he thinks now. Maybe Angus already knew he would shortly be leaving them. Mike studies his nine-year-old self. The white, hairless legs poking out beneath the anorak and shorts seem pathetically fragile. He studies his mother. She's 31, still a beautiful young woman, if only she'd smile a bit. But Isabel was never going to smile for this photograph. Just as the stranger holding the camera, Michael knew this instinctively, was not a man who was ever going to say, say cheese. And then it was done. And Angus thanked him and took the camera back, and that should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. The man lingered as if he expected something more than Angus's thanks. A tip, perhaps? Michael sensed his mother's rage simmering again, but it was the man who put his hand in his own pocket and drew something out. He stepped towards Michael with his clenched fist extended, and the boy automatically stood up and went towards him. Michael, Isabel said, but whatever the mystery was in that fist, he wanted it. He held out his hand and the man dropped something in it. And with a quick, fierce movement, closed Michael's fingers over it. The man's hand was rough and dry. Michael glanced up at him. His stare was intense and distant, as if he were looking both at and right through him. And then he let go and walked away without a word. He was separate, ag separate again. He seemed separate from everything, a lonely figure hunched into the wind. And then he stopped and turned and stared at Michael again. And Angus must have seen the potential of that picture, the man in the road staring like a prophet, the cows, the light bouncing between the clouds and the sea, the looming dune ray dome. And he took it. The decisive moment, Cartier-Bresson called it. And what a great photograph it is. When Mike first came upon it, he immediately decided that it would have to be a late addition to the exhibition. But it's the other one, the not very good one of the family that he keeps going back to, as if somewhere in it there is a clue, advance notice how, how, of how everything was going to be. That was why he wanted to show it to Murdo, to say, look, this is where I come from. Do you think that wee boy ever imagined life turning out like this? When the man was 20 yards down the road, Michael opened his hand, and there in the palm was a pebble. That was all. A small, smooth, disappointing pebble about the size of a broad bean. It could have come from a beach, or a field, or a garden path, anywhere. Isabel demanded to know what it was, and Michael showed her, and she told him to throw it away. But he would not. And when she failed to appeal to his father for support, Michael slipped it into his pocket where he kept it for days, feeling its inconsequential smoothness with his fingers and thinking about the man. Eventually he lost it, it was nothing, but the man had given it to him. And even now, when he thinks of the pebble, he remembers the intensity of the man's stare. They carried on with their picnic. In the basket was a thermos flask of Heinz tomato soup, heated up by their landlady of the previous night, and a bread wrapper full of cheese and ham sandwiches she'd also made for them. They drank the soup, dredged their way through the sandwiches. Angus paced around like an eccentric lecturer, firing information at them between bites and swallows. He was trying to explain how a fast reactor worked, how it produced more fuel than it consumed, converting uranium into plutonium, so in effect could go on making electricity forever. Energy and perpetuity. He wanted to convince them of the significance of where they were, how their lives were linked to the power of the atom. 
but he was wasting his breath. Because Isabel and Michael were hardly listening, they were eating and drinking as fast as they could so they could pack up and move on, so he could take them to John O'Groats, where they'd get out and do whatever you were supposed to do at one end of the British Isles, and after that drive onto the god-awful hotel or bed and breakfast, he'd earmark them for, the, for them for the night, where hopefully there'd be a hot bath and maybe even a fire. They didn't care a docker about nuclear fission, and he probably didn't understand half of what he was trying to explain. They were all out of their respective depths. And so they packed up the picnic things and drove away from the wondrous white dome building, the white dome building perched on the edge of Scotland. And as they were going, Isabel said, that man was a tramp. What man, Angus said, the man who took the picture. No, Angus said, dismissive, but quite jovial at first. Surely not. Tramps have long, straggly beards and ten overcoats, and they smell. He didn't smell too bad. She sighed at his childishness. There was something about him. What? Michael could tell her sigh irritated his father. There was a tone to it, and a tone to his short response. Two noises full of impatience and disrespect. I didn't like him, giving that stupid stone to Michael. Oh, well, that's him then, condemned and transported if you don't like him. Bloody vagrant, handing out stones to kids. Anyway, what if he was a tramp? He scowled in the mirror. Michael, do you think he was a tramp? Michael said, well, his clothes weren't that dirty, but they were old looking. You see, Isabel said. His face looked like it was made of leather, Michael said. Like he spent a lot of time out of doors, and I think he had quite a lot of clothes on, but he was very thin. You see? Isabel said again, so that Michael, who hated being on her side, had to add, but I don't think he was a tramp. Well, what was he then? Isabel snapped. I, I don't know. Maybe he was mad. Don't be ridiculous, Isabel said. The idea of insanity scared her more than vagrancy. Tramps don't go around handing out stones, Angus said. But I don't give a damn who or what he was. I asked him to do me a favour and he was kind enough to oblige. You're lucky he didn't drop your camera, Isabel said, or steal it. Angus muttered something Michael couldn't hear. If we pass him, don't offer him a lift. I might just do that, Angus said. One good turn deserves another. If he gets into this car, I'm getting out. Michael prayed fervently for them to pass the man just to see what <laughs> happened. But they didn't. A heavy, hateful emptiness gathered under the roof of the car. Michael slumped back, pulling the anorak hood up over his head, preferring the seashell effect of the fake fur against his ears to the dead silence that he was learning to recognise as the soundtrack of a marriage beyond repair. And in his pocket he felt for the pebble and wondered why the man had given it to him and what it might mean. Looking at the photograph brings it all back. It's like a still from a film of other people's lives. Michael and Mum and Dad. And they became Mike and Isabel and Angus, shifting uncertain identities. When he thinks about those shared lives, about human existence in general, he finds there is not much to put faith in. But this he knows for sure. Our ability to look back on the past, our need or desire to make sense of it, is both a blessing and a curse. And our inability to see into the future with any degree of accuracy is simultaneously the thing that saves us and the thing that condemns us. Come all ye tramps and hawker lads, ye gatherers so blood. The tramps, the country, run and run, come listen in and all. I'll tell to you a roving tale, O oh, sights that I have seen. Far up into the snowy north, and south by Gretna Green. Now I've seen the high benevus a towering to the moon. 
I've been by Kerry Fan Callender and Sooth by Bonnie Doon. I've seen the Nathy Silvery Tides and places out again. Far up and to the snowy north lies Sarkert's fairy glen. Of times I laugh unto myself when trudging on the road. With my bag a blow upon my back, my face as brooms a toad. With lumps of cake and tatty scones and cheese and braxy ham. No thinking in the morning at night. For I'm to gang. Now I'm happy in the summer time beneath the clear blue sky. No thinking in the morning at night for I've to lie. And bar nor bayer or any for dosen out among the hay. And if the weather does permit, I'm happy every day. Now I'm often doon by Gallowall. And round about Stranraer. My business tax me on a war. I've travelled near and far. And all my days so roven, there's nothing that I lost. And all my days. My daily bread and what'll pay my dues, but I think I'll gang to Paddy's land. I'm making up my mind for Scotland's greatly altered now, and I canna raise the wine. But I will trust in providence, gin providence prove true. And I will sing, O oh, Aaron's Isle, when I come back to you.